Frightening new details of the final moments of an Ethiopian Airlines flight are now emerging. The Wall Street Journal is citing sources familiar with the preliminary investigation, and it says the pilots initially followed emergency procedures that had been outlined by Boeing, the airplane manufacturer. CNN has not been able to confirm this re uh, report. Despite the pilots' actions, they were unable to gain control of the Boeing 737 MAX 8. The aircraft then nosedived into the ground on March 10th, killing all 157 people on board. And this comes as a new Senate committee is investigating whether FAA inspectors were properly trained to certify the aircraft. We have CNN correspondent Tom Foreman, who's here with us. And, and Tom, this could potentially undercut Boeing and also at the FAA and its claims that following emergency procedures would have fixed the problem. Yeah, Brianna, because this cuts right to the crux of the matter. Remember, in the Indonesian crash last fall and more recently in this crash in, crash in Africa, all the attention has been focused on this system called MCAS. MCAS is software on board the plane. And here's what we're talking about. I'll bring in a model. Because of the positioning of the engines on the MAX 8s and MAX 9s, they have a tendency to want to nose up in the air. The MCAS is automatic software that's supposed to kick in and bring them back to level. But if they get a false reading from the instrumentation in the front, it could push them into a dive. That is the fear here. So the procedures for the pilots are to go through and basically shut down MCAS and bring the plane back to level and fly on. So if these reports are true, what it's saying is that when the pilots did that, the plane continued. They would pull it back up and MCAS would push it back down. And back and forth they went up until crash time. That is a very big change with Boeing and the FAA saying, well, maybe the pilots didn't follow the right procedures, Bree. And then there's also this new reporting from Reuters about just how many times this anti-stall software may have re-engaged after the initial turnoff. It, it's, however, uh, important to note, it's unclear whether the crew redeployed the system or if this kicked in automatically. Why does that matter? It matters because it's a continuation of the earlier thought. Look, if you're saying, as the FAA and Boeing, that the safety of these planes can, in fact, be controlled from the cockpit, but if some bug, if something wrong is making an automatic system, a robot on board, take over control no matter what they do in the cockpit, then you have a completely different equation. We don't have answers to any of this. We're all desperately waiting for the preliminary report from the Ethiopians to find out which parts of this may be true, which details may refute it. But all of this keeps the future of this plane very much in limbo. Is this just a technical problem? Is this a pilot problem? Is it a combination of the two? And when and how is this going to be solved to the satisfaction of the airlines, the pilots, and the flying public, and all those families who lost loved ones in these crashes. Yeah, Tom Foreman, thank you so much for outlining all of that for us. And I want to bring in former NTSB Managing Director and CNN Aviation Analyst Peter Goals with us. Um, what did you think of this report? Well, Brianne, it was two things that, that stood out. One was that the Ethiopian pilots were trained. They were well trained. And Ethiopian Airways is noted for that. They take their training seriously as they take their maintenance seriously. Secondly, it's a setback for the recertification of this plane. If they're, you know, they, there's a question of it was at a lower altitude than the Lion Air. Why did it kick in so early? If it kicked in multiple times, there was simply not enough room for these pilots to recover. And it, this, this is a problem. And then this rep uh, Reuters report, the, the system may have re-engaged up to four times before the crash. There's still some unanswered questions about that. But how does a pilot deal with something like that? Well, how do you deal with it after you followed the procedure to turn it off? That's the question. They had gone through the procedures according to the uh, Ethiopian release or the, you know, the leak that, that these guys had shut the system down and had followed procedures and it had not solved the problem. Uh, there may be a speed issue involved, but this is really quite, quite challenging. Boeing is having another problem right now, of which I'm sure you are familiar, this other Boeing plane, this other model. It's uh, the KC-46, and these are used by the Air Force. So they, at this point, are actually refusing delivery of this plane. And the reason is because of, quote, foreign object debris 
in closed compartments. Let's listen to what the Secretary of the Air Force, Heather Wilson, had to say about this. We actually uh, uh, stopped again the acceptance of the KC-46s because of foreign object debris that we found in some closed compartments. We've got corrective action in, in place, uh, including a 100% look at some of those closed compartments uh, to make sure that the production line is being run the way that it needs to be run. Foreign object debris in closed compartments. Explain that to us. What, what is the debris that we're talking about and where would this have been found? It could be anything from metal filings to, a, to like tools. tools to other paper debris. Uh, in any case, it indicates a quality control issue. Before that compartment is shut, it needs to be checked, it needs to be cleaned, it needs to be in A1 shape. And if Boeing isn't doing that on the line, it's another black eye. That seems like pretty basic stuff, Peter Goles, sweeping out the compartment. Am I wrong? It, uh, All it right. is fundamental. Uh, fundamental. All right, Peter Goles, thank you so much.